A member of your team is in the morgue. And I am responsible for his death. Yes, I am painfully aware of that. I sent him in there and I will have to live with that for the rest of my life. But we have a responsibility to understand what happened and learn from it. We open up with Shepard's team scouting a planet they found in the Atlantis database that's supposed to be populated by the randoms. Unfortunately, they don't detect any life signs, but to their surprise, they find an enormous amount of space wreckage in orbit around the planet, including a Wraith hive ship. Which is kind of weird, because if the debris were in stable orbit, it would surely have spread out more around the planet over 10,000 years, and wouldn't be this concentrated in one place. Or if the debris had no momentum, it would have crashed into the planet thousands of years ago. But whatever. McKay detects an energy reading on the surface and remarks, They were ancient. Where's the energy coming from? We have no idea. Presumably it would have to be a ZPM to be able to maintain power over 10,000 years, right? It never gets answered and later we see McKay just power up the outpost effortlessly. Right, you're, you're gonna need to be a little more specific. Then we see a massive turret-like weapon mounted on said outpost and Shepard's team enter it. They discover that the interior is in surprisingly good condition, but also find a few bodies here and there, which already raises questions about what happened here. After McKay powers up the station and asks what Shepard just asked him a second ago, This is an ancient outpost. Why would the Wraith leave it intact? We see Shepard's team back at Atlantis reporting their findings to Weir in form of a pretty well done and concise exposition. In just under one minute, we recap everything our characters know. It's a military research facility and the weapon is similar to the satellite-based weapon that we saw in Season 1, but with the firepower to take on an entire Wraith fleet. And we learn of the importance of further researching it, but also about the reservations our characters have, because there are still open questions about the whole thing that even McKay can't answer yet. And that means, uh, well, I'm not sure what that means, but it means something definitely worth finding out. In an effort to answer these questions, Shepard and McKay return to Duranda with Zelenka and the science team. After a bit of researching, McKay and Zelenka report that the weapon is actually not the most valuable asset here, but its power source, called Project Arcturus, and that it would change the future of humanity as The greatest discovery of all time! Back at Atlantis again, McKay and Zelenka explain to Wee and Caldwell the specifics of the technology, which works similar to the ZPM, but on a bigger scale. And that an unknown major malfunction occurred in the past, which led the ancients to abandon this technology. Despite this, they managed to convince Wee that they would be able to finish the project. Can you believe you can finish their work? I do. We do. They do. During the whole discussion, McKay can barely contain his excitement and downplays the potential risks and disparages the Ancients and their competence. Which is understandable, because his experience with Ancients hasn't been that great. They kept a deadly nanovirus in a lab without proper warning signs that almost killed many people on Atlantis and their strict rules after Ascension prevented using Proculus as a refuge. Additionally, McKay is someone who doesn't really trust other people and their competence, even if he undoubtedly respects them, and that doesn't exclude the Ancients. He is an inherently paranoid and suspicious person, and this leads to him ignoring other people's opinions in favor of his own logical rationalizations, and his ego just magnifies this issue. Back at Duranda, we get a montage of the scientists working, and a while later they seem to be ready for the first test. Right after commencing the test, Zelenka picks up some minor issues, but McKay assures that everything is under control. At this point, Shepard already suggests to abort the test because of these unforeseen problems, but McKay orders Collins, a fellow scientist, to try and manually fix the issue by sending him to a control panel that's adjacent to the hazardous containment area. He said it's fine. Collins, see if you can boost more power to the field manually. Shortly after, a power spike occurred that surprised and concerned even McKay, prompting them to finally abort the test. Unsuccessfully at first, but eventually they managed to shut it down. Unfortunately, too late for Collins, who died from radiation which escaped the containment field. Back at Atlantis, people try to find out what happened, but the only thing McKay knows is... In terms of physics, it shouldn't have happened. Weir shuts the project down, but despite or maybe because of all that happened, McKay is more committed than before to find out what went wrong. Plagued by his guilt, he approaches Shepard to try and convince him to convince Weir to start the project back up. He appeals to him by saying he wants to make Colin's death mean something. Colin's death is a pointless waste of life unless something comes with this, and I am not sure that I can... And continues with his assertion that the Ancients made a mistake in their calculations, and that he found his own solution. The Ancients had it wrong. Our mistake was using their equations. Look, I just did the calculations again myself. I did them three times just to be sure, and I am positive the problem is in the automatic containment protocol. Here we get to another important aspect of McKay's character. 
Many people would say that McKay is the smartest person in two galaxies, but unfortunately he lacks the wisdom to apply his intellect prudently, which he seems to be painfully aware of. Music was my salvation. It had this perfect order for me. When I was 12, my teacher told me to quit. A fine clinical player, he said, but no sense of the art whatsoever. I turned to science because I thought it would be different than music, but it isn't. It's just the same. It's just as much of an art as anything else. You're an artist, Major. Maybe the best I've ever seen. I'm just critical because I'm jealous. And combined with his immense sense of duty towards science, but also his colleagues and home planet, this leads to him taking great risks for their advancement and safety, which we have seen in the past. We send a massive EM pulse back through the wormhole, knock out whatever it is that's making this happen on the other end. Will that work? No, sir. I already thought of it, and the reason I didn't mention it is because it is far too problematic. More so than the gate exploding? The iris would have to be open. Well, the gate room shielded, isn't it? In this case, he even gambles the trust of one of his closest friends. Because Shepard isn't buying into any of his arguments yet, as a last resort, he asks Shepard to trust him. One could even theorize that he's purposefully overconfident in this case, because as he says, The risks are nothing compared to the potential benefits. I have never asked this of you before, but I think I've earned it. Trust me. And so he might knowingly put his life and reputation on the line for the small chance to benefit humanity. Nevertheless, this leads to Shepard actually taking McKay's side. And so we see him and Caldwell in Weir's office trying to convince her to resume Project Arcturus. While Weir argues that McKay might be in over his head and elevates the ancients to some kind of omniscient beings, Caldwell is actually willing to put his trust in McKay and accuses Weir of putting the ancients on a pedestal. Both sides are understandable, but ultimately these arguments are just a facade. Whether Caldwell really believes in McKay's abilities, or Weir actually believes the ancients to be infallible, is irrelevant, since their true motivations lie elsewhere. Weir is not ready to take the unknown risk and endanger any more of her people. Whether she can't see the potential benefit, or if she simply doesn't care, we don't know. One would think that especially after the recent siege of Atlantis by the Wraith and coming very close to the city being destroyed, she'd be more willing to take the necessary risks to protect it. Caldwell, on the other hand, doesn't try to hide his ambitions. He can clearly identify what this project would mean for Earth and Atlantis and lets Weir know that his superiors will not let this project go. Why are we mincing words, Colonel? You want the weapon. Yes, I do. A weapon that could effectively eliminate the Wraith threat is very attractive to me and to the people that I work for. But there's more to it, isn't there? No more hunting for its ZPMs. The shield at full strength, faster, more powerful ships. Finally, we have Shepard who ensures Weir that he can keep an eye on McKay and lets her know. He asked me to trust him. Though Shepard shouldn't have mentioned this, especially because it isn't a good reason. As much as it might mean to him, it's not rational and Weir shouldn't make a decision based on that. Her decision should be based on Shepard's assessment of the situation, which interestingly enough, we know very little of. He seems to be excited about the weapon, but also shares Weir's concern that more lives could be lost in further researching it. But he doesn't offer any arguments of his own while Weir and Caldwell are debating this. Ultimately, he doesn't seem to have a strong opinion either way, which is pretty disappointing. Finally, Weir concedes, probably because she knows that eventually this decision will be out of her hands, and at least now she can still do it her way. So McKay and Shepard return to Durand alone this time to resume the project. Emboldened by that fact, McKay cracks a few confident jokes, which leaves Shepard quite unimpressed and maybe even considering if he made the right choice after all. How about I carry out my plan and you keep the hot coffee coming? So, joking again, right? Shortly after, we see Atlantis making contact with the two and Weir and Zelenka expressing their newly discovered doubts that the project could ever work. But this close to the finish line, McKay is unwilling to listen to any concerns and even lashes out at Zelenka. As a friend, I have serious doubts. Well, you're wrong. I'm sorry, but there it is. And to bring this up now when I'm just about to do this smacks of nothing but professional jealousy. They explain how the weapon killed everyone on Duranda when it got out of control, but McKay doesn't back down. I don't know how else to say this, but none of you are capable of understanding this on the same level that I do. And in Zelenka, that includes you. At this point, he is so convinced by his rationalizations and logical conclusions that he simply cannot imagine being wrong. Because if he'd be wrong, the science would be wrong. He just can't envision that his understanding of the physics is not sufficient in this case. He is all in on this. Can you do this? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Are you sure you're sure? I said yes! Because if you're wrong... I'm not! Why Weir and Shepard ignore Zelenka's warnings and still allow this to continue is unknown and pretty questionable. 
but they do and so McKay begins the test. They bring the reactor and the weapon online and immediately after the software registers an energy variation, which McKay tries to compensate for manually as planned. But as things seem to escalate, McKay is faced again with the terrifying realization that he's not in control anymore. There is no logical reason this shouldn't be working. Okay. None of this should be happening. Look, the energy levels are spiking at a rate far greater than anything I predicted. Shut it down. Regrettably, they decide to shut everything down again, but this time they are not destined to be as lucky. And as the power builds up uncontrollably inside the reactor, the weapon starts firing indiscriminately at anything in range. McKay still tries desperately to shut the reactor down, but Shepard tries to stop him and abandon everything, and we get one of Flanagan's best scenes and line deliveries in the show, in my opinion. No, you can't! One second! I've seen this before, Ronnie. Pilots who wouldn't eject when something went wrong, trying to fix their planes right until it hit the ground! We really get a sense of dread that something he has witnessed countless of times before might happen again, but this time he's in a position to do something about it. So we see him get a bit forceful, and one might even get the impression that he's ready to drag McKay to the jumper if he keeps refusing to comply. Fortunately for the characters, but unfortunately for us, it doesn't come to that, because McKay realizes that the energy buildup is escalating beyond the point of no return, and that a disaster is about to happen. Okay, we need to leave. I've waited too long, the weapon can't discharge enough power to avoid a catastrophic overload. This whole planet's gonna go up. Not that your speech wasn't working. They quickly board the jumper and they try to escape to the Stargate before the solar system gets destroyed. After Shepard skillfully dodges the energy blasts, we get a quick shot of the Daedalus coming to our hero's rescue, and so they manage to escape before the Daedalus enters hyperspace. The only question here is, why didn't Shepard try to activate the cloak? Back at Atlantis, we see Taylor and Ronan come back from their travel, and in the background we can hear Weir tearing McKay a new one. I tried my best to identify what's being said. In the aftermath, we see Shepard trying to avoid McKay, who has been trying to track him down to apologize to him. After unsuccessfully trying to break the ice with another joke, we get a sense of sincere regret about how things turned out. Honestly, I would, I would hate to think that recent events might have permanently dimmed your faith in my abilities, or your trust. Shepard doesn't hesitate to let him know about his disappointment, but finishes with a comforting statement that he fully believes his trust can be re-earned in the future, which leaves McKay optimistic. This episode is mainly filled with character conflict, exploring their personalities, their relationships and motivations. The focus of this episode is obviously McKay. We saw him in a position we rarely got to see him in. He was wrong. About pretty much everything, even if his motivations were well-intentioned. He misjudged his abilities, how he dealt with his colleagues and their criticism is questionable at least, and ultimately he miscalculated the science, which he bases his personality on. His excitement over discovering this incredible technology eclipsed his otherwise neurotic and pessimistic nature to the point of becoming almost reckless. We saw him deal with that failure, although it's a wasted opportunity to not show at least some consequences of this in the following episodes. We saw him deal with the loss of life that he indirectly caused, how he responds to a situation like that, and what his thought process was to try and make the tragedy count. We also see the lengths he is willing to go to, to fight for something he believes in. We've always known that he's willing to endanger his own life to save others, but in this case he was risking his life simply to honor someone else's death. All characters acted reasonable for the most part and consistent with their motivations, with the slight exception of Weir, who in my opinion pushed back a little too much, especially in light of the stakes, which we get into in a second. But she eventually always gave in, which is why it's still fine. Shepard could have made up his mind a bit more, but since it's not exactly his area of expertise, this is also forgivable. Caldwell, on the other hand, represented Earth's and military's interest faithfully. Zelenka definitely deserved a race after this, because he was pretty much the only one who saw all this coming, and had the courage to challenge McKay even if unsuccessful. The stakes were very high for this episode. Atlantis barely survived the last Wraith siege, and they don't know how long this ruse of cloaking the city will last. The most innocent mistake could give their existence away, and they would be fighting for their survival again. Meanwhile, in the Milky Way galaxy, the Ori became a serious threat, and even though at this point the military doesn't know how serious yet, based on the prior's capabilities, they have every reason to believe they will need any technological advantage they can find. And very, very soon, if they don't know already, they would find out that the Ori have the capability to construct supergates across galaxies, because the episode Beachhead aired on the same day as Trinity, August 19, 2005. In conclusion, Trinity's main plot is narratively almost flawless, with the exception of some trivial nitpicks at the beginning. 
Where many other episodes require a minimum amount of suspension of disbelief to make them work, Trinity requires none of that. The plotline and our characters' actions are logically consistent. Never are we left questioning if our characters are actually acting true to their beliefs or principles. The pacing is steadily accelerating and only slowed a bit by the excessive back and forth between Atlantis and Aranda, culminating in an unprecedented disaster that will get referenced in many future episodes. The themes are for the most part serious, but also leave room for tasteful quips and jokes that bring much needed relief from the increasingly tragic undertone. Trinity proves that great science fiction doesn't necessarily need to rely upon tense shootouts or big scale spaceship battles. In my opinion, there are only very few episodes in the Stargate franchise that achieve their intended goal in a more professional and satisfying way.